يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أطى الله بقلب سليم وقال الله تعالى في مقام آخر من أراد الآخرة وسعى لها سعيها وهو مؤمن فأولئك كان سعيهم مشكورا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Alhamdulillah, it's the first time that I'm having a talk when there are people sitting on my right and my left. Normally I'm facing the audience. <laughs> so, Alhamdulillah. So we were in Scotland this morning and just landed and that's why, sorry, it's a lot of traffic in London. I know there's traffic but uh, we're expecting they'll be here by 6.15ish, so apologies for being late person. Who must but that give? our brother an opportunity to talk about his projects, inshallah, so that's, everything is good. So, I was just told that the topic is the sound heart, and uh, in fact, I was, that helped me because I was thinking, what should I be talking about? You know, all of our human beings are made up of two things. Everybody, all of us. One is our bodies and one is our ruh, one is our soul. And it's very unfortunate that we, all what we know about is that our bodies, honestly. Our focus is our bodies from the morning to the evening and until we sleep at night. That's what we are focusing on, absolutely. We get up in the morning, we take a shower, we take a bath. We put on perfumes, we put on, we use the shower gels, shampoos. The women, they use foundations and all of these makeups. For what? For, for, the, for our bodies. And then we wear the best clothes. We come to work, making sure that we are looking good. And then we work all day long. And at the end of the day, we get a salary, a paycheck. And we all have our plans as to how are we going to use our wealth, the money that we are going to get at the end of the year, at the end of the month. What car are we going to buy? Which houses are we going to live in? And honest, this is a common person's life. A common person's life is this, isn't it? Be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. I was happy to hear a few things that people are going, trying to do outside their norm. But normally, generally speaking, this is what people are focusing. Who are, going to, who are they going to get married to? How many children are they going to have? Which houses are they going to live in? What's, what, where are they going to send their children to? Which universities? Which colleges? Everybody is focusing on that. And that is all about our bodies. Honestly, that's it. That's it. What are we going to eat? MashaAllah. What sort of flavor do we have for the cookies? Uh, what is that? Fruit and lemon? Mm. And something ginger? It's amazing the number, the types of food that we have. You go to a grocery store and the types of food that you'll have is so difficult for you to pick up. All right, you know, which cookies should I be picking, picking up? And so many brands, so many flavors, so many drinks. For what? For, for our bodies. But what about our rule? Where is the soul? Right? The reality of human beings is the soul. And the proof is that when the baby is in the womb of the mother, before, there is a certain time that's just a piece of flesh. And a time comes when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts ruh in that body. And then the heart starts beating. Baby comes out, lives all his life. And at the end of his life, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his soul away. Ruh. The body is still there. But the ruh goes. So we don't call him that person anymore. We don't call him Abdul Rahman anymore. What do we call it? A dead body. Right? He's not there. It is Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman has gone back. Where he came from. 
So our reality was what? Our reality was ruh. But so unfortunate that people don't even know, number one, that they have a ruh, that they have a soul, and people don't even work on their ruh. <laughs> what does it mean working on the ruh? You know, we all have been given a heart. And all that we know about is a, is a physical heart, which is part of the body. But there is a spiritual heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks, He talks in the Quran about the spiritual heart. For example, for example, Prophet وسلم, he has mentioned in one of the hadiths, in one of the prophetic narrations, that when a person disobeys Allah Ta'ala, when he does anything that's against the commandments of Allah Ta'ala and his messenger, وسلم, then there's a black dot that appears on his heart. And if he repents, if he asks for forgiveness from Allah Ta'ala, then that black dot is removed. If he does not do that and he commits another sin, then there is another black dot that appears. And he continues to do so until the whole heart becomes black. Now people may wonder, all right, he's talking about the physical heart. But say for example, you take, you do an open heart surgery of a person who is disobeying Allah Ta'ala all the time. Is, is, is his heart black? It's not. It's just a normal flesh. So what is he talking about? He's talking about a spiritual heart, which we don't see, but there it, it's, it's there. Allah Ta'ala talks about that in the Quran, in many, many places, at many places. So we have a spiritual heart, and the ruh, the soul, it is centered on that spiritual heart that we have, and the, our mashayikh, our spiritual teachers, they have highlighted that that is also in the chest. Just like the physical heart is in the chest, the, the spiritual heart is also in the chest. And subhanAllah, people experience that. People experience as to where they are. But forget about where it is. It's there. Allah, it's proven from the Quran. It's proven from the Hadith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that we work on that heart. Allah ta'ala says that on the Day of Judgment, this is one of the ayats that I recited in the beginning from the Quran that Yawma la yanfa'u manu wa la banoon illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. That on the day of judgment, there is nothing will benefit you. And Allah Ta'ala highlighted two things. He said, Your children will not benefit you, your wealth will not benefit you. What will benefit you? Who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart, bi qalbin salim. So Allah Ta'ala wants that we work on our heart all of our life. And when it's time to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we go back in a state that our heart is sound. So what does that mean? Any of the wealth that we are earning, that people are focusing on day in and day out, every single day of their life, it's not going to benefit. People, one of the things that people want is to get married and have children, and that's now their whole focus changes to their children, you know, which school, grammar school, private school, public school, which college, which university, what are they going to do in their life? It's not going to benefit at all. Allah Ta'ala says one thing is going to benefit. What is that? You come back to me in a state that your spiritual heart is sound. So subhanAllah is an amazing, it's a very powerful ayat. Yani in other words, all the efforts that we are putting in in our life is going to go waste. Yani on, we are all going to go back to Allah. There's a day of judgment and we are all going to be judged and then we will be decided as to where are we going to end up. And we, what are all the focus that we have, it's, it's basically we are out of focus. That's the problem, isn't it? Allah Ta'ala is saying it. I mean, mashallah, we are all are Muslims, hopefully. Is there any non-Muslims sitting here? Nobody. All of us are Muslims, alhamdulillah. We all believe in Allah and we all believe in Quran and we all believe in the Prophet. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But subhanAllah, this is what he is saying, that's what Allah Ta'ala is saying, and our focus is absolutely lost. So, so you all have to work on it, it's an ayah of the Qur'an. So what does that mean, that you work on your heart, that you come back to Allah with the soundness of your heart? This, 
Hadith that I mentioned, that every single thing that you do against Shariat, every single thing that you go do against the commandments of Allah Ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it puts a black dot on your heart. So that means that it is corrupting the heart. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wants that we remove that dot rather than accumulating those dots. Allah Ta'ala wants that we, we as human beings, we do slip. We do slip. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that we always have that connection with Allah so that we recognize and we realize as soon as we slip so that we remove that dot by doing istighfar, we're asking Allah ta'ala for repentance, doing tawbah and making a commitment that I'm not going to do that again. This is what keeps the heart sound. And one more thing that keeps the heart sound, see, just like our bodies, we need nourishment, right? We eat food every single day. We all have a lunch break because if we don't eat, then we feel lethargic, we feel weak. We don't eat for like two days, possibly we'll be on the bed, we will not be coming to PWC anymore, right? So we'll be calling a sick leave. Why? Because we have not eaten for two days, three days. Just like that, our heart, it also needs nourishment. Our heart also needs nourishment. If you don't give food to the body, it feels lethargic. You go, don't feed your heart, your roof feels lethargic. If you don't feed your body for like, everybody's different, but let's say for example for a week, it's going to fall sick. You're, you don't give nourishment to your heart, your roof will become sick. You don't give food to your body for like 10 days, 15 days, possibly it'll die. Just like that, you don't give nourishment to your spiritual heart, it'll die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that there are few people who are walking on the earth but their dead bodies walking on the earth. What does it mean? They're dead? Literally dead? No, their hearts are dead. Their hearts are dead. Why? Because they did not nourish their hearts. They did not nourish their hearts so their hearts die and there are bodies walking but the heart isn't there. It's dead. The spiritual heart is dead. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, number one, that we keep it polished. Anytime that we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we, that black dot that appears, rather than accumulating those dots, we wipe off that dot from the heart and do rep- and repent to Allah Ta'ala and st- keep, continue striving towards the obedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and of His Messenger. And number two, keep giving nourishment to the heart. What is the nourishment to the heart? Nourishment of, to the heart is what our brother was talking about, honestly. Every good action is the nourishment of the heart. Every prayer is the nourishment to the heart. Every fast is the nourishment to the heart. Every recitation of the Quran is nourishment to the heart. Every zikr is the nourishment to the heart. Every charity is the nourishment to the heart. Every helping each other is the nourishment for the heart. These are the nourishment for the heart. Whenever we do a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy descends and it comes to the heart and that's what the nourishment of the heart is all about. See, you need to understand this thing. Allah Ta'ala created our bodies in this dunya. In this, there are two basically alams, there are two universes. There's one alam which is, we call alam of dunya, and there is another alam which is another world, another realm. I mean, there's more technical details to that, but I'm not going to go into that. But I need time to explain that. But just understand these, this thing. There are two types of alams. One is this realm, and there is another realm. And our ruh has come from that other alam. Our bodies are created from this alam. These are made out of dust. The body is made out of dust. Right? And the ruh is coming from that spiritual realm. So, this is another phenomena that all of the needs of something, anything that is created from a specific alam, its needs are also produced in here. So, Allah... I, I lived in Chicago, I live in Dubai now, but I, before that I used to live in Chicago. I went to a museum in Chicago, just like the biggest museum, the Field Museum. And there was a whole section that only, that was that they had made to prove that every single one of our need, actually it comes out of, it comes out of earth. Food, like all the crops, vegetables, fruits, Animals, where do animals get their flesh from? They eat grass, right? So that's how they develop their flesh. They said clothes, cotton comes out of the earth. 
Every single thing, you name it, and every single one of our need comes out of the earth. Because our, are, our bodies are made out of dust, they are, it's made out of earth. Very interesting. Our nourishment of our bodies come out of the earth. So ruh, which comes out of that spiritual realm, so the nourishment of the ruh comes out of that realm. And what is that? I mean, in short, if you call it one, if you want to call it one thing, that's mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come? By doing every single good deed. That attracts the mercy of Allah. This is an ayat of the Quran. For example, that Allah Ta'ala says that when Quran is recited, <coughs> Then keep quiet, listen to it attentively, so that you be shown mercy. Yani the mercy will descend upon you. Prophet Sallallahu said that every you, when you send salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi one time Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sends rahmat on him ten times. Right? Every single letter of Quran that you recite, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you reward of, gives you ten rewards of one letter that you recite. So every single good deed, every single good deed, it attracts the mercy of Allah and that is the nourishment of the heart. But so unfortunate there are people who have absolutely forgotten to give nourishment to their hearts. So unfortunate because they have even forgotten that there is something called ruin there in them. People don't think about that. So friends, this is something that we need to, to develop. As Muslims, we need to understand our reality. See, Allah Ta'ala has given us two blessings, many blessings. But there are two blessings that I want to talk about specifically. I've already talked, spoken about the heart and the body. But there are two things related to the heart and the body. See, heart has emotions. Heart has emotions. And then there is also intellect that we all have been given. All of us have been given intellect. We all think, mashallah, you all, all of your auditors, uh, majority of you, no? And what are you doing for B- BWC? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know? All right. Mashallah, getting a good paycheck at the end of the month. That's <laughs> certainly good. Looking busy doing nothing. Huh? Well, that's fine. But at mashallah, you're all sitting here, so at least you've gone through some an, an educational system. Allah Ta'ala has given us an, an intellect that through which we think. You know, it's a very powerful blessing that we all have been given, this power of intellect. It's very, very powerful blessing. And this, this, this blessing of emotions that is in the heart, that's also a very powerful blessing. Very powerful blessing, these two. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that we use these blessings, the power of intellect and the power of emotions for Allah. That's what all life is about. Subhanallah, we don't understand that. That what is life all about? You ask a person, just walking, a person walking down the street, a Muslim, I'm talking about a Muslim, walking down the street, a kid. I'm not picking any of you, inshallah. But say... If you ask a kid, like a 16-year-old, 18-year-old, a girl or a boy, walking down the street, you ask him, interview, interview him. What's the goal of your life? What do you want to do with your life? What do you think he's going to say? I'm sure majority of them will be lost. Majority of them will be lost. They'll be having a headphone on their ears, maybe possibly jogging, and all what he wants to do is to build his muscles and, you know, remain fit. And girls... Will have their own things, right? They'll be lost. You ask them, what, what do you want to do with your life? What is the goal? What's the purpose? I don't know. I don't know. So honestly, majority of this is like also a very common thing in the kids. I don't know. They don't know at all. And, and that's a calamity by itself. That a Muslim doesn't know what is he going to do with his life. What's the purpose of his life? Honestly, I was I went to Ohio State University in the U.S. I did my master's in electrical engineering there. I, sometimes, if there was a project, I will take the last bus that will come, that will leave the campus and come to where we used to live. And majority of the people, guess who are they? Chinese, Indians, not Muslim Indians, Hindu Indians, Chinese people some Americans, you will hardly find a Muslim kid 
with that vision. I'm talking about dunyavi vision, worldly vision. That vision that I want to be the best. People don't even have that, Muslims. Chinese are better. Indians are better. Right? With no faith as such. They do have faith, their own faith. We're talking about the true faith. They don't have the true faith. Yet, they have a vision in their life. At least they want to do something. That's why China is where China is. Right? That's why all of these, Europe, the West, is where, where it is. Because they have a vision. Muslims used to have that vision. You go back, our kids don't even know our, our own history. They don't know about Ibn Battuta. They don't know about Ibn Sina. They don't know about any of these Muslim scientists and all of these people. This is what kids are doing. This is what youth is doing. No vision whatsoever. I'm talking about worldly vision. But our vision should be beyond worlds, right? All of us are dying. There's death coming for all of you. You start from my right and all the way to my left. Everybody will be dead. In 100 years, 100 years is too long. I think very soon, all of us will be underground. I'm not talking about London underground. But they'll be underground, right? All of us will be underground. Under the ground, right? Nobody can deny that very fact. I will be gone and you all will be gone. Without an exception. And our journey continues. Our journey continues beyond that grave. Our journey continues beyond, you know, of the day of judgment. We're all going to live somewhere at the end of the day. It's a final abode. What's the vision? Muslims don't even have a vision. Where does it start from? This power of intellect, my friends. This, this, what we have been given, we have to think. And then when we think, we all have to have these emotions that we have. We have to use those emotions to actually have that willpower to implement that vision. Understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the second ayah that I recited in the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man arad al akhirata. Whoever makes a decision, an irada, a commitment of akhirat, not dunya. Dunya, Allah ta'ala gives to everybody. Man arad al akhirata. And the second, wasa'alaha sa'iha. And then they make an effort for that. Allah ta'ala says, Man arad al akhirata. وَسَعَالَهَا سَعْيَهَا فَأُولَٰئِكَ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ And he's a believer, he has iman. فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيَهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Allah Ta'ala says his efforts will be appreciated. Yani, in other words, I will give other to his efforts. But what does Allah Ta'ala talk about? What is Allah Ta'ala talking about? Two things. One, commitment. Make a niyat first. Have a commitment. Have a vision. And two, then make an effort. Use your emotions to make sure that it is fulfilled. You have to be, have passion. You have to be passionate. MashaAllah. You know, people are passionate. It's not that people are not passionate. Some are. But not everybody is. Unfortunately today, nobody is. When we say nobody, very few means nobody. So Allah Ta'ala wants that we make that commitment, that irada, that we have to have that talab, that, that desire for the akhirat. And you also have to, also have, to have passion to achieve that goal. Allah Ta'ala wants that. And honestly, this is exactly what a sound heart is all about. You, in order to, first thing, to make your heart sound, in order to nourish that, in order to make sure that we are going back to, we, we make an effort to go back to Allah Ta'ala with the soundness of the heart, we, develop, we have to develop that passion. Allah Ta'ala wants that we have to develop that passion. And this is exactly what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed in people. People, you know, look into the, the times of jahiliyyah, times of ignorance, before the Prophet ﷺ. They did not have any vision. You know, we all talk about vision in the corporate culture. You know, what's your vision? Every year we have a vision. You know, you talk about the corporate, they come up with that. You know, the, 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 the CEO will come up with the, with a mission statement or he'll come, will come up with a vision of 2015. What's our vision? Muslims also have to have vision. Prophet ﷺ changed the vision of people. That's exactly what he did. It's so amazing. You know, some atabi or tabatabi. You know, there are generations. So there are Sahaba who were in the with the Prophet ﷺ. The next generation is called tabi, and the following generation is called tabatabi. The third generation. So third generation tabatabi. They asked the tabi in the second generation. Because they had seen Sahaba. He said, how were the Sahaba like? How were the Sahaba like? He said, they were not different people outwardly. 
He said that possibly you are praying more than that what they were praying. Possibly you are fasting more than they were fasting. But one thing that they definitely had which was better, their vision was very strong. Prophet ﷺ changed the way that they were thinking. That's exactly what he did. He changed the way that they were thinking. What do you think if you ask a young man in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what's your goal, what's your vision? What do you think he's going to say? I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm going to be a CEO. Do you think that if you ask a girl, a sahabiya, a young sahabiya, radiallahu anha, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what's your goal? Or well, I'm, I'm going to get married to this man. Do you think that this was going, what's her, what a goal, goal is going to be now? Their goal was so different. So different. And their goal was akhirat. Man arad al akhirata wa sa'alaha sa'yaha wa huwa mu'minun fa ula'ika kana sa'yihum mashkura. Their irada, their goal was, vision was akhirat. It was so amazing that, that the people, their focus before the time of the Prophet, focus, alcohol, alcohol addicts, deeply addicts in al- alcohol addicts. Women, they were, they used to fight with each other just to prove that they are strong. That's what, and they would fight for small little petty things. Everybody wanted to be ruling, status, being high. This is what they were thinking. Absolute dunya, that's it. And not only that they were doing it for themselves, if people will die in a battlefield, then their, their children and their, their people following, they will write poetry in the, in the praise of their predecessors, you know, how strong were they. And you'll read Jahili poetry, you read all of the poetry that is, you know, in fact, we do study that in our Alim curriculum just to understand Arabic language. And you will be amazed that there are two topics of the whole poetry. What is that? War? How strong, how brave, two women. That's it. The whole poetry were, was revolving around two things. How brave were our people? How did they fight? And number two, you know, women. That's it. There was no third topic to their poetry. That shows their mentality. What, what were they thinking? Status and sexuality. Are we different? Food for thought. Are we different? If you ask a young man, I don't think he's any different. Either he's looking out for status, some sort of wealth. And number two is this thing. Sexuality is on the minds of people, honestly. And there are issues. the reasons are, unfortunately, internet, unfortunately, cell phones, unfortunately, data, all you can eat. Mashallah, <laughs> that's what three is offering. That's it. What? What do the? What do I watch on my data? All that I can eat. I mean, of course, movies, YouTube's, Facebooks. That's the vision of people, young youths. That was what they were doing. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam changed the way that they were thinking. No, no, it's not about dunya. It's about akhirat. We all are dying. We all go, all are going to go back to Allah. Allah Taala demands the sound heart. Change the way that you are thinking, and Allah Akbar. The way that they change. So much change that Prophet, so they were in that, they left extreme, they went all the way to the other extreme. And then Prophet also had to pull them back to bring them into the middle. Three Sahaba came to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, Ya Rasulullah. So he was not there in the house. He was there or he wasn't there. But he was, he could not, they could not meet with him. They met one with one of his wives. And they asked her that, how is the ibadat of the Prophet ﷺ? How does he worship? Tell us about him. And she told them about that Prophet ﷺ. He fasts for certain days and then he does not fast for certain days and he, he worships for a certain portion of night and he also rests. And you know, all, all what he did. And these Sahaba, these three Sahaba, they thought that it's not enough. How come he's sleeping? How come he's not fast? He's also not fasting. And then they thought, oh, by the way, he's the Prophet. Peace be upon him. We are normal human beings. You know, his status in the, in the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so high. We are small little human beings. So we should be doing something more than him. Look at the way now they are thinking. From one extreme all the way to the other extreme. So one of them made a commitment. He said that I am never going to break my fast. In other words, I am going to fast every single day. The other said, alright, I am going to worship all night. I am not going to sleep. 
The third said, I'm not going to get married at all. So this Umm al this this wife of the Prophet ﷺ, she told this, what they are thinking to the Prophet ﷺ. Ya Rasulullah, this is what these people are thinking. And they were very close, Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ got upset. He came. He said, are you the ones who are saying, who are saying these things? Look at from one extreme to the other extreme. He said, no, come back. إِنَّ لِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا Your nafs has a right over you. Your body has a right over you. In other words, you must sleep as well. And your, your family, وَلِأَهْلِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا Your family has a right over you. It's not that you're just fasting all day, all night long. إِنَّ لِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقًّا Your guest has a right over you. He said, I fast and I don't fast. I sleep and I also worship at night. And I've also gotten married. So you, this is my sunnah, this is the middle way, don't go to the other extreme. But what I'm trying to say is, look at the way that Prophet changed the way that they were thinking. Absolute, basically 180 degrees shift. 180 degrees, this is exactly what it did. And my friends, this is what we need to change. MashaAllah, you're all smart people. That's why you're here, sitting here, MashaAllah. But, you're good in your dunya. One thing that we all must also change is the way that we think. And if that, you change that, I can tell you, inshallah ta'ala, that will be, that will be a big stepping stone in, in our history. And that's why I focus a lot on people who have dunya education, who have worldly secular education. Because mashallah, subhanallah, you go to an Islamic school in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, or unfortunately, there are not many in other parts, other parts of the world. Very unfortunate. Do you know that, by the way? I live in the Middle East. There's not even one Islamic school, as they call madrasa. I'm even scared to use this word because it is such a, it's a word that media has, has, has been using in a negative way, unfortunately. So unfortunate. But an Islamic school. You know, you, there is none in the, in, in the UAE. There's none in any of the Gulf countries. You won't believe that. You won't believe that. I'm so worried about their future generations. There's hardly any in Africa. There are either in the, in the, in the Europe, mashallah, you're many here in the UK. You go to South Africa, mashallah, there are many there. But who, who have started that? Subcontinental people, Indian, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis. It's very, un- you will be amazed to hear that because some people are coming from the subcontinent, there is so much inferiority complex as if there is no Islamic education and what have they learned from that place, part of the world, as if it's all fake. It's not that true. <coughs> Mashallah, you know, we are all here, all learned from Arabs, of course. They are our teachers. But I'm so worried about their future generations. Honestly, I'm so worried about them because there's nothing like that. There's no formal education anymore at the grassroots level. But anyway, you go to all of these madaris and you will be amazed that who will, who are, who, who, what sort of kids are there? Either they have failed in their dunya, secular education, and their parents are so upset that, you know, they're not doing anything in their schools or they have run away from schools and they'll put them in that, in that institution. Majority of them are like that or who cannot afford secular education because these madaris are giving education for free, they'll put them there. And that's why, I mean, the produce that is coming out is not of that level that used to be. So what's the solution? The solution is one out of two. One is either people choose to send their children who can't afford, children are smart, they choose to send their children there, and mashallah, that's happening now. Or two, people like yourselves change. Honestly, you can be the leaders. But for that, what we need to change is the vision. We cannot live our life like this, my friends. We cannot. You know, half this, half that. All right, we pray five times a day and also let's watch a movie. It, it cannot work like that. Allah Ta'ala is saying, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُدُّمْ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Tell the believing men, lower their gaze. قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغُدُّمْ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Now tell believing women, they should also lower their gaze. Don't look at each other with desire, with lust. It, it breaks the heart. It, it, it corrupts the heart. You are supposed to go back to Allah with a sound heart, not a corrupt heart. It cannot, can't work like that. You either have to be 
Not either have to be. You have to be one way. That's to have focus. It should be akhirat. We cannot live our life like this. Have this half, have that. We have to change our vision. We must, please. And for that, we need to have these sort of sittings. So that we are reminded. You know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made khutbah of, waj- of Jumu'ah wajib every single week. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala knows that this is what everybody wants. People need to get reminded. Otherwise they will forget. And our problem is, this is another issue because we don't have a vision, because we don't even want to, you know, to, 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 uh, to go in this path of spirituality or to, get this, to go in the path of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. People don't even care about that. That's what I'm saying. People don't even know that there's a rule that needs to be nurtured. And these sort of gatherings are also the nourishment of the rule. So people don't even care. How many people actually make an effort and go and sit in the gatherings where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, you know, on a regular basis, maybe once a week at least. Where are the people? Hardly. But when it comes down to, you know, eating out, everybody makes sure that they go and take their family out for in a restaurant every week. Right? So we need to change our vision. And Allah Ta'ala has mentioned people in the Qur'an that with that vision. And for me and you, why are these stories mentioned in the Qur'an? They're mentioned in the Qur'an so that we can take lessons from those stories. i would give you a couple of stories and I'll end inshallah. You know, and subhanAllah, it's interesting that both of these stories that I want to share with you are the stories of the women. And I'm sharing that for a reason. If women can do that, men, why can't they do it? They, they claim to be stronger, right? Although, you know, subhanAllah, I, I teach women as well. And I personally have a feeling that if women, they come on the path of Allah Ta'ala, they can actually surpass men. And the reason is because they're very passionate. They're very passionate, mashallah. Their jazbat, their their passion, you know, their they can actually if they love somebody, they will love it, love them from the heart. If they hate somebody, my God, they cannot survive anymore. Seriously. So keep your wives happy, all right? One of the stories is the story of the mother of Sayyidah Maryam alayhi salam. Sayyidah Maryam, as we all know, you know, mother of Sayyidah Isa alayhi salam, who Allah Ta'ala gave her a miracle that she gave birth to Sayyidah Isa alayhi salam without a husband. Her mother, when she was expecting Maryam alayhi salam, her mother's husband was Sayyidah Imran. There is a difference of opinion that if he was a prophet or not. But irrespective, he was a very, very righteous man. And he was the caretaker of the masjid. And he was serving the masjid. And would serve, who was a preacher and a, serving the masjid. When Maryam was, ex, sorry, the mother of Maryam a.s. was expecting, the, her husband passed away. Sayyidina Imran alayhi salam. Allah Ta'ala loved this family, by the way. Allah Ta'ala named two surahs. One is Ali Imran, the family of Imran, and two, Surah Maryam, right, on the, the, the surah of Maryam alayhi salam. Loved the family so much, there are two surahs in the Quran that are named after the family. So, the husband passed away. So the mother, now look at the vision. The mother, she says that this baby that is in my womb, I want to also dedicate my baby for the service of the masjid as well. SubhanAllah, we all have children. What's our vision? When women are expecting, what's their vision about their babies? About their... Hmm, always thinking, first thing, SubhanAllah, some very unfortunate people think that they are in in the modern era, but subhanAllah, sometimes I think that we are in the jahili era. People want male children. For what? You know, it looks like we are back in the old days of jahili, where people would bury their daughters alive, right? Because they didn't like daughters. Same is is true today. 
People believe it or don't. They want to expect, accept that or they don't want to accept that, but that's true. I've seen families, they don't like me children. I don't know why. Daughters are blessings. They're blessings. Prophet ﷺ said that whoever has two daughters or more and they take care of them well, do their tarbiyat, and they raise them up and get them married, teach them deen, he will be with me in paradise. What a maqam. Daughters are mercy, they're blessings. So anyway, the mother wanted that I want to dedicate my child for the service of the deen. In the womb, yet. And she was also expecting a male child. But not for this very fact that, oh, I'm going to grow old one day and he will serve me, he'll go out and earn. I'll bring pounds and dollars of work in PwC and we'll bring some cash. No. For what? That because needed a male child so that they go and serve the masjid. A woman, a girl cannot do that, right? She cannot go into the masjid, sweep the floor, lead their prayers. Cannot do that. That's why she wanted a male child. But she made a dua to Allah. Because she knew, although I have this vision, but it cannot be implemented until and unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will want that to happen. And Allah, she made a dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned her dua in the Quran. She said, Rabbi inni nadhartu lak, inni nadhartu laka ma fi batni muharrara fataqabbal minni. Ya Allah, I make a vow that whatever is in my womb, I want to dedicate that child to your service. Please accept from me. Please accept. Allah Ta'ala loved that dua so much, He quoted her dua in the Quran. We all recite it. Baby is born. Guess what? A girl. And she is worried. Rabbi inni wada'atuha unsa. Allah Ta'ala. She's talking to Allah. Allah Ta'ala is mentioning the whole discussion. <laughs> Rabbi inni wada'atuha unsa. Ya Allah, I gave birth to a, to a girl. And Allah Ta'ala says, I know. I know she is a girl. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ unsa. Males are not like females. They're different. I know she is a girl. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So what? Can't girls be accept, expect, accepted? Of course, girls can also be accepted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقُبُولٍ حَسَنٍ I, ex- I accepted this girl. Don't worry, oh my, oh, my mother of Maryam. Don't worry, I accepted this girl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named her Maryam. And so amazing that this Maryam, alayhi salam, I mean, it's a long story, unfortunately, I wish that we had come on time, it's not our fault, and we had started on time. But it's an amazing that how, what did Maryam do? Because of Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, gave this humanity two prophets. One, we all know, Isa alayhi salam, a miraculous birth. And there is another prophet that came in the, to the, that came to the humanity, who is Yahya alayhi salam. How come? You know, Yahya alayhi salam's father, Zakaria alayhi salam, he was the uncle of Maryam. And once Zakaria alayhi salam came back home, and he was, because the, she did not have a father, he chose to take care of Maryam, her uncle, Zakaria alayhi salam, who was a prophet. And one day he came back, and she, he saw that Maryam alayhi salam has unseasoned fruits. Fruits and unseasoned, no refrigeration, no transportation. It's not that there were huge refrigerators and they can store the, the winter fruits and they can use in summers, right? Unseasoned fruits. And he got amazed. Ya Maryam, anna laki hadha. Where did you get it from, Maryam? And she said, my uncle, what are you amazed about? Huwa min indillah. It is from Allah. Inna Allah yarzuku man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. Allah ta'ala can give risk to whoever, whatever he wants. Zakaria alayhi salam was a very, very old man. Very old. And his wife had become barren by that time. She could not expect a baby anymore. When Zakaria alayhi salam saw Maryam eating unseasoned fruits, he thought, why cannot Allah Ta'ala give me an unseasoned child? If I'm old and my wife cannot give birth, you know, biologically speaking, technically speaking, so what? Allah Ta'ala can do whatever. He made a dua at that time. He said, Ya Allah, I know that I've grown weak. I know, Ya Allah, I'm old. There are white hair that are spread on my, on my, on my head and on my, in my beard. But Ya Allah, I have never lost hope in you. Ya Allah, I make dua to you. Please give me a child. And Allah Ta'ala gave him a child. Yahya. What? How is it coming? Because of Maryam. 
Maryam gave two prophets to this humanity. This is what I, this is a statement that I, I'm, I'm, I want to make. And why? Because of the vision of her mother. Because of the vision of her mother. The way that she was thinking before even the child birth of Maryam. And she taught Maryam that. And Maryam became that woman, a woman who actually became the source of two prophets. Allah Akbar. Vision, my friends, vision. And the second I want to briefly mention is another woman who is the wife of Pharaoh. <laughs> the most tyrant person on the face of the earth that has ever come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using him as, uh, as an example of, the, of, the, of, of, of oppression. And please, I recommend all of you to read the story end to end of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. But As- Asiya was her name. And Asiya, when she expected, accepted Islam, she accepted the call of Musa alayhi salam. Musa, uh, Fir'aun, her husband, he got very upset and he loved her very, very much. Very much. This woman that he loved so much, she was the beauty queen of that time. He like literally handpicked her. Loved her very much. Allowed Musa Islam to live in the palace. Right? We all know the story. If we don't, please go and read it. When he got to know that her, his wife has accepted Islam, he said that either leave it or I'm going to torture you to death. She refused. Look what happened. A beauty queen living in the palace, enjoying the luxuries. Every single luxury she had, every single luxury you can, can, you can think of. Because Iman entered her heart, her vision changed. She said, I don't care, Firaun. You want to torture me to death, do it. Because my vision has changed to Akhirat. And subhanAllah, there are different riwayat that are written in the books that how did Pharaoh tor- torture? And one is that she actually forced her out. Of, when she refused again and again, he, he forced her out of the palace, right in front of the palace, actually undressed her in front of everybody and put nails in her, in her hands and in her feet. And there are many things that are mentioned, but he continued saying, leave it, leave it. If she said, no, no, no. And he said, that I'm going to peel off your skin and I'm going to throw a heavy stone on you and you will die. At that time, look, palace was right in front of her eyes. And this was a palace that where she was enjoying every single luxury of this dunya. She made a dua at that time and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also quoted her dua in the Quran. She made a dua that, Ya Allah, I don't care about this palace anymore. My vision has changed. Rabb ibni li indaka baytan fil jannah. Ya Allah, I need a house near you in paradise. Who cares about this palace? I want a palace in paradise in your neighborhood, Ya Allah. But Ya Allah, I'm weak. He's torturing me. What if because of extreme torture, what if I lose my faith, which is the most important thing in my heart? Ya Allah, wa najjini min fir'awna wa amalihi wa najjini min, min, min al-qawm al-zalimeen. Ya Allah, please save me from, from Fir'aun and his actions. And Ya Allah, save me from these oppressive people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua, took her soul away with peace. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala welcomed her in paradise. And these people, they were thinking she's still alive and they continued torturing. But they did not know that it's just a dead body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua, gave her a palace in paradise. Look at the vision that changed. My friends, this is what we need to bring. It's dunya, only dunya, I'm not saying leave dunya. Continue working in PwC. I don't want resignation letters tomorrow morning. Please continue working. But change your vision. Please. It's not about only dunya. We're all dying. All of us are dying. But we need to work for what's after death. Prophet is saying that he is intelligent who subdues his desires and acts on what is coming after death. And he's saying he's stupid, who is only busy following his desires and have hope in Allah, that Allah is merciful, he'll forgive. Prophet ﷺ is saying that. This is not intelligence. You're intelligent, don't think like that. He's saying work for what's coming after death. So please change your vision, my friends. Work on your hearts. Please follow Sharia and Sunnah 100%.
Udhulu fisilmi kaafa. Allah Taala says in the Quran, enter into Islam 100%. Don't pick and choose. People have their own, you know, favorite ayat and ahadith. They will always quote a few, one or two, right? They will always, they always know that the husband is the amir of the house, right? but they don't know that they have to be good with their wives as well. And they always pick and choose. So please don't pick and choose. Enter into Islam completely. Complete shariat, complete sunnat. Complete sunnat. Outward sunnat, we should look like Muslims and we should act like Muslims. Our ikhlaq. You know, people, everybody around you in this office should become Muslims just by looking at you. But if they also, you're also going to movies with them. You're also sitting at the bar with them. Even if you're not drinking, some are also drinking. If you're also talking about women, if you're also talking about immodest death, you're also backbiting people. What's the difference between you and them? We should be those people that people look at us and say, oh, you're, he's different. What's, you know, I met a, a gentleman in, uh, in Wolverhampton. He's a convert an English convert. And I asked him, what made you accept Islam? He said, one of my colleagues. He said, I used to work and he was such a beautiful gentleman. He said, he was such a high character. His ikhlaq was so beautiful. I could not resist but ask him, you know, what is it, where is it all coming from? And he said, it's all about what my deen has taught me. He said, I accepted Islam. I started studying Islam and accepted Islam. So we can all change the whole environment, what we need to change. So please, my friends, Please work towards Akhirat. Please change your vision. Learn deen and follow deen. Don't follow your desires. Lower your gaze. Control your anger. Control your desires. Don't become jealous people. Don't be arrogant people. Don't be, you know, don't have keep ill feelings in your heart, hatred in the heart. So people love each other. Love each other. Forgive others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look like Muslims. Act like Muslims. Work for the Akhirat. Make your heart sound. Please also, also give your heart nourishment. And there is no better nourishment than, than fulfilling the faraid. Five prayers, not four, not three, at their times. If you have a meeting, so what? I mean, you can always step out to go to the toilet. Why can't you step out to pray four rakas or eight rakas? Right? There's no excuse. Honestly, I've worked in the corporate culture for so long. Alhamdulillah, never even once, you know, I missed a prayer. Alhamdulillah. And my boss, my, he knew that, you know, this time for my prayers, this time for my Friday prayers, I need to go. And he will himself ask me, you know, if I'm not going, oh, you're getting late, why don't you go? So alhamdulillah. So you need to, but you have to be that smart. Also, you have to be good at your work as well. So that people, you know, they want you. If you're already not, you're being sluggish in your work, and if you're doing all of these sort of things as well, I mean, they're already finding a reason for you to, to make you redundant, it will make you redundant. But if you're good, you must be good at your work as well, being Muslims, be honest at work. Don't, not only checking emails all day long and you know, have control tab and hide the window, email when your boss comes in front of you. Don't do that. Please be honest at your work. Please be good at work. But that's also part of the honesty. Love other people. No, no hatred, no animosity, no ill feelings. Somebody does wrong to you, forgive him for the sake of Allah. Control tongue, don't lie, don't backbite, control your eyes, don't watch anything that is not allowed. Please lower your gaze, be good people, inshallah. And this, and please pray five times a day. Don't make it four, three, two, one. Inshallah, please, women, you know, honesty, it's an honor to cover up. Allah Ta'ala has given women honor, ikram, to cover up. I always tell my sisters, I said that, you know, subhanAllah, anything that is precious, we hide it. We cover it. Not hide it, cover it, right? There are rocks on the streets. Nobody covers them. Nobody cares about them. We just, we hit them with our feet. But there is another rock. It's called a diamond. You know, people have diamonds. What do they do? Do they throw it on the street? No. They pick it up. They keep it. Whenever they go back home, take it out, you know, put it in a box and then put it in another locker. Because it's precious. It's precious. Women are precious. Allah Ta'ala has given so much ikram to women in our deen. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. This is an honor that Allah Ta'ala is giving to them to cover up because they are so precious. So please, let's not give back. And don't, let's not throw that honor away that Allah Ta'ala is giving us. Please, work on your hearts. May Allah Ta'ala give us, give us all tawfiq. Wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, five minutes for questions. See, uh, all right, that's fine. Yeah. But we need to.
Free answer, and we have to leave as well ASAP. Five yeah, minutes. That's fine. Has anyone got any questions? It was discussed. If we can keep it relevant to the topic, inshallah. <coughs> I, I had a question. Um, so, um, so often you're talking about the sound heart and um, you know working on the heart and avoiding sin. And often you find yourself getting trapped in sinning. And you mentioned that we should repent. Um, but then there comes a time where you feel guilty because you commit that sin again and again. You think to yourself, um, am I being hypocritical because really I'm not doing Tawbah uh, because I'm committing that sin again. And then you you end up going nowhere and, and then you're, you're internally fighting yourself. How do you deal with that situation? Let's take it from another angle. What else can we do? Is there any other alternative? Should we decide that, all right, I'm not able to control myself, so let me just do it all my life, right? That's not an option. So if we look at it from that angle, then there's only one thing that we can do is to continue working on ourselves and continue working on our hearts and continue try to control that, that uh, habit. Basically, it's addiction. All of the sins that we're not able to leave, it's addiction. Like people have alcohol addiction, people have smoking addiction. Some people have this sinning addiction. Some people cannot control their gaze. Some people cannot stop, you know, control their anger. This is all addiction. So just like any other addiction is treated, this addiction should also be treated. And it's more deadly because, you know, people not leaving smoking cigarettes, they will die a, dead, a bodily death, right, a, a physical death. But if you don't leave a sin, you'll die a spiritual death, which is even more deadly. So you need to understand, because this is, this is what we are doing, this muzakara, this reminder is actually to, to, to make us all understand that how deadly is that. And because unless and until we don't understand that how deadly is that, we'll never be able to work on ourselves. But, so two things. One, some definitely we should work on ourselves. And for that, I mean, there are different ways which I did not mention. One is to take a teacher in your life and, you know, work with him. It's like your spiritual doctor, just like you work with your physical doctor, your medical doctor. You take a, phys a spiritual doctor, he helps you, you know, taking you step by step to, 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 uh, in, in getting rid of that. And two, and until and unless, if you slip again, do Tawbah. So do Tawbah. Allah Ta'ala loves Tawbah, by the way. Allah Ta'ala loves Tawbah. A person sins, it comes in the hadith, a person sins, and when he does tawbah, Allah Ta'ala says that, oh, this person has repented because he knows he has a Rabb. He knows he has a Lord, he has Allah. So he, Allah Ta'ala forgives him, and he does it again. It comes in hadith, and he does it again after some time. And then he again feels guilty, ya Allah, I'm sorry. Allah Ta'ala says he knows he has a Rabb, that's why he's repenting again. He said, oh, I forgive him again. And then again after some time he commits that. So we should never, this is a trick of shaitan, it's just a whisper of shaitan, we should never ever feel that, oh, you know, I'm gone, I'm a gone case. We're never a gone case. Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala is so merciful that as far as we are trying, and even if we are slipping again and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always forgive us. Please never lose hope, never, ever. And inshallah ta'ala, either we'll be able to overcome that, or inshallah, even if we are not, say, may Allah make us from those who are able to overcome our shortcomings. But even if not, inshallah, we have hope from Allah Ta'ala that He will forgive us, inshallah, at the end of the day. But I was thinking about one more thing. Is Some people say, oh, you know, I, I'm sinning, so why should I do tawbah? You know, I, I always tell them this, you know, why do we take a shower every day? You know, we know that we are going to get dirty again today, we are going to go out, we are going to sweat. So does it mean that I'm going to sweat again tomorrow? Should I should not take a shower? Of course. Right? We are going to get dirty again, but we still take a shower because we need that shower today. It's so just like that. You know, even though people might be feeling weak, but they should always repent and feel guilty about what they have done. It's the most important thing, being guilty. Because if people aren't feeling guilty, then they are arrogant in front of Allah Ta'ala. As if they're arrogant. Ya Allah, I don't care. Here am I doing what I'm doing. I don't care. You say whatever. Right, this is what Iblis did. He asked, Allah Ta'ala ordered do sajda to Adam alayhi salam. He said, I'm not doing. What should I do? I'm better. So this is arrogance. And Allah Ta'ala rejected him from his court. So please don't be arrogant. Feel guilty about what you're doing. And make dua as well. 
Also, one thing that we also forget is we don't make dua. That, Ya Allah, you help me please. I don't have strength, you have strength. You please give me strength to get rid of this disease of mine, this shortcoming of mine. Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah. No, no, I know. I, I'm, 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 we are short of time as well. Inshallah, so lovely to, to be with all of you. Jazakum Allah for taking your time out. Inshallah, we'll end with the dua. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. Rabbana ghalamna anfusana wa illam taghfil lana wa taghfilna lana kunanna min al-khasirin. Rabbana la tazak qulubana ba'da iz hadaytana. Wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inna kunna min al-zalimin. Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكر إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان واجعلنا من الراشدين يا الله يا رحم الرحمين please accept this gathering from all of us يا الله the shortcomings that we had in this gathering please ignore that يا الله please forgive us of that يا الله please accept it from all of us Ya Allah, the effort that has been made in conducting this gathering, please accept that effort. Ya Allah, please, because of that talab, that desire of the people, Ya Allah, to come and sit here together, please make it the source, Ya Allah, of attracting your mercy. And Ya Allah, please, today, Ya Allah, we do tawbah from all the sins that we have done in our lives. Ya Allah, please, 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 Ya Allah, change our dead hearts. Please, Ya Allah, change our dead hearts. Ya Allah, please, change our dead hearts. Ya Arham ar Ya Allah, please give us tawfiq that we'll be able to live a life of complete shariat and sunnah going forward, Ya Allah. Please, Ya Allah, accept all of us for the service of your beautiful deen. And Ya Allah, please provide us bab from your infinite treasures to Ya Allah, to serve your deen. With khair, afiyat, barakat, usad. Ya Allah, give us the best of the dunya and best of our qabr and best of our akhirat. And Ya Allah, please gather all of us in Jannah for those. Ya Allah, in the neighborhood of your beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And most of it all, Ya Allah, grant all 